today, we're kicking this thing off that's intended to lead us into more peace and freedom. And so often, you know, when we come to church, we, we talk about all the things that we should do and all the things that Jesus tells us we should do. But this series is all about discovering the things that Jesus says what you should not do if you want to experience peace and freedom. And uh, so if you have your notes, we're going to get ready to jump in here. Also, our parent viewing room is open. If you have little ones that get fussy during the service, you can take them out the back door there, make two lefts where you can find the room, uh, our parent viewing room, where you can watch the service live with us. Well, my very first job when I was 12 years old was a paper boy. Anybody remember their very first job? And I would have to go with my dad or my mom and I'd have to pick up all the newspapers and I'd get like, I don't know, two or 300 newspapers. I'd have to bring them home. I'd have to roll them, put a rubber band on them, put them in my bag. And then every Saturday morning, I would walk the neighborhoods and I would be tossing my newspaper into the yard or throw it on their doorstep. And I think... I don't know, maybe I made a penny a newspaper or something. It was a total ripoff, right? I did not make enough money as a 12-year-old. Uh, but anyway, as I was walking, there was this one particular house that always scared me to death because there was always a ferocious giant dog in the front yard. And every time I came by the house, the dog would run up to the fence and would be growling like I was the biggest steak it had ever seen in its life, just salivating and barking. And he would bark for four more houses, you know, as I'm walking Dog was absolutely terrifying. Well, there was one Saturday that as I walked up to the house, almost simultaneously, both myself and the dog noticed that the gate was about that much open. And as he began to bark and run, I threw the newspaper and just started running for my life. And I'm running down the sidewalk and the dog is behind me barking and screaming. And for a brief moment, I had superhuman strength. I really did. I ran faster than a speeding bullet. And thankfully, for my heart rate and my physical well-being, the dog gave up its chase and pursuit of me and went back home. And ever since then, I really haven't liked big dogs, right? I mean, I've had this unhealthy fear my whole life that I'm still going to be eaten any day by a dog. Anyone else afraid of bigger dogs? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still afraid of them. And I think all of us experience things in, in life, whether real or perceived, that induce incredible fear in us. And we spend so much time running from it because we really don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to handle it. And, and I think our fears really began when we were kids, don't you think? Right, when you were told, don't lick the nine volt battery, don't you dare do it, right? Uh, don't you dare climb the tree, don't stick anything in an outlet, don't walk home from school alone, don't look at the sun, you'll go blind, and certainly don't go swimming 30 minutes after you eat because you could forget how to swim and die, right? I mean, that was what we were given as kids, and so fear was induced in us. And if you didn't come up with your own fears, we have culture and the news media who are teaming up together to bring you the latest and greatest thing you should be afraid of. Right? I mean, if the wrong politician gets voted in, you're done for. If you eat the wrong food, you're dead. If you drink the wrong thing, your health is doomed. Uh, if you stay in a tanning bed too long, the disease has already arrived. If you invest in the stock market, you're about to be bankrupt at any moment. If you're working in the housing industry, your future is gone. Isn't that true? We're just given this cycle of fear over and over again. And interesting, Sandy Lamont, a CNN correspondent, said this of the media. They want you to be full of fear, all of them, all of the time. And they'll do just about anything to try and make it happen. And we know this. I mean, if you opened up your news app right now, what would you see? About 20 stories of horrible bad news, right? All the bad things that have happened in the last couple days in the world. It induces fear in us. And I do realize that fear can be, at times, a good thing. I mean, if it moves us to action, uh, if it becomes self-correcting response that takes us off the wrong path and puts us on the correct path, that can be a good thing. Just like Proverbs 22.3 says, that a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Right? So for the person that can foresee danger and you go, oh no, that's not good. I'm, I'm afraid of that outcome or that future and I change paths. Sometimes fear can actually become your ally. Fear can be a good thing. But most of the fears we wrestle with, this is the first filling on your notes, most of the fears that we wrestle with are unhealthy and toxic. Fear that becomes our enemy. 
And I think we could all agree on that. Most of the fears that we wrestle with are unhealthy, they're toxic for us. And that fear actually becomes our enemy. It's, it's fear of job loss or finding one. Fear of what others think of you. Fear of failure or financial loss. Uh, fear of some sort of medical crisis or, or fear of something happening to your kids. Uh, fear of the unknown. Uh, fear of not measuring up uh, or making mistakes. Uh, fear of disaster. Uh, fear of terrorism. Fear of even death. Uh, it, it's amazing the amount of fears that can rattle around in us, but if I were to ask you this morning, what is one or two fears that you deal with the most? What would you say they are? Think about that for a moment. I mean, what are the consistent fears that tend to paralyze you if you let them? It's important for us to understand that Jesus understands this level of fear, right? He became human like us. He's experienced what we've experienced, and he gives us this simple analogy to remember and he leads us into our first not of this series. The first thing that we should not do. And here's what he says in Luke chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. You never knew that. Never thought that God's keeping track of even the birds. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. All right, Jesus leads us into this first not to say, I don't want you to deal with fear. Do not fear. He says, I've got all of the details of your life covered. I know everything about you. I even know how many hairs are on your head, and for some of you, it's dwindling by the day. And he's still keeping up. He's still counting. He says, I know it all about you. You are so valuable to me. If I don't even lose sight of one of the birds of the air, how much more are you valuable to me? And so here's the reality that we find ourselves in, your next villain, that we can't control our feelings, can we? Thank you. We can't control our feelings. We can't. We can't control when fear rises up, but we can control our response. We can control our response. And as a follower of Jesus, you will have to determine how you're going to respond to the uncertainty that is in your life. Right? When fear rises up, when something happens and, and you're paralyzed by it or you can't sleep and you're thinking about all the what ifs, all the negative things that could go wrong. Are you going to continue to bite your nails right, and just talk about worst case scenarios all the time? Or are you going to feed your mind with potential what ifs and all the things that could go bad? Or are you going to fuel conversations with fear by passing that along to other people? And the opposite of that, our Heavenly Father wants to help us in response by guiding us through our fears, leading us through our fear. I mean, look at this incredible passage in Psalm 23. We pick it up in verse 1. It, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Now listen to some of this. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, whatever your greatest fear is, Right, the things that keep you up at night, the thing that paralyzes you. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Isn't that amazing to think about? I mean, all these terms leads me to rest. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews me, guides me. And even when I face my deepest fears, I won't be afraid because you're right beside me. You protect me, you comfort me. That is what our Heavenly Father wants to do. And I think we all, we love to hear that and we want to believe it. But if we're honest, we really don't want to be guided through fear, do we? We really don't want to be led through fear. On the contrary, what we want is we actually want to be led around our fears. We don't want to deal with them in the first place. 
We don't want any difficulty or any tragedy. We don't want anything difficult. We don't want anything to be afraid of. God, could you just make our life perfect? God, could you just make our life so easy we never have to fear anything, we never have to be afraid? But that isn't how God works. That isn't how he works. Even though we want the guarantee of my safety, we want the cure to cancer, we want the end of terrorism, we want my marriage to end up happily ever after, a booming economy, right? We want all of those things, but God doesn't promise any of that. Instead, here's what we need to realize, your next feeling, that from God's perspective, uncertain times are opportunities to build our trust in him. And from God's perspective, his, his hope and his goal is that we would become more and more like him until the day we die. And so he will take these uncertain times, he will take these fearful situations, and he wants to teach us again and again how to put all of our trust in the shepherd who leads us beside peaceful streams to teach us how to trust the one who will renew our strength, the one who will be right beside us through every difficult thing that we face. It's an opportunity for him to remind us that ultimately he's our provider and he's our protector and he's our healer and he's our peace and he's our strength. He is the one who is our source for it all, not our government, thank God, not our employer, not the doctor, not Dow Jones. He is the one who ultimately meets our every single need. And in fact, he wants to lead us through this fear so our perspective begins to change and we fear less and we trust him more. And that can only happen as he leads us through this process and we grow because of it. And it reminds me of this summer, we took our youngest son Paxton to Valley Fair, my wife and I. And all week leading up to it, I've been telling him about the wild thing, right? The biggest, baddest, you know, roller coaster at, at Valley Fair. And, and he's like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And when we got there, his tune began to change a little bit once he saw it. And in fact, there were many times that we were walking up the sidewalk to go and we'd have to turn right back around and we'd walk back. And then we'd walk up the sidewalk and we'd walk and he'd say yes and he'd say no and then he had to go to the bathroom and then his hands were nervous, you know, he's sweating and, and I said, buddy, you've got this, dude. You can do this. I'll be right beside you. He's like, okay, I'm gonna do it, dad. I'm gonna do it. And so I would like to show you his stages of emotion through eight pictures that took place during this roller coaster, okay? Eight pictures, eight stages of his emotion. So here's this first picture of him riding up, right? He's on the way up and he is totally unsure of what is happening right now, rethinking all of his life choices. Next picture, we're getting near the top and he says, uh-uh, I cannot watch, I can't even look, I don't even wanna look. And then we start to go over, here's the next picture. <laughs> and uh, he is holding on for dear life. Here's the next picture. We're not quite at the bottom yet. And he is, <laughs> he, is, he is beside himself in fear. Here's the next one. And he just, he, he can't even help himself. He's like, what am I doing? And then something begins to shift in him. And here he is. We're about two thirds of the way through the ride. Next picture, look at this. I mean, he is just loving his life. And then this last one, I love it because he's like, I made it. This was at the very end. I made it. And as we got off the ride that day, I really think he became a little bit more of a man in that moment. I mean, he conquered a fear and we got off. He's like, let's go again. And I kid you not, we went six times on the wild thing. And dad was feeling it. Let me tell you, I was like crying mercy by the end of it. Please, can we stop going on the wild thing? And what was amazing to me is here he was, not even willing to walk up the sidewalk. He was so fearful. And after he faced his fears and dad by his side and he conquered it, he just wanted to keep doing it over and over and over again. A total, complete shift in him. And it reminds me a lot of us as we go through this. The idea that our heavenly father says, I know that you fear those things, but I am right beside you. And if you will learn to trust me, you can actually conquer every one of your fears. You don't have to live in that anymore. It doesn't have to paralyze you anymore. Let me help guide you right through it. 
And so just like Paxton changed on that day, so we can change when it comes to the fearful things in our lives. But the question is how? How do we change with the fear that paralyzes us? How do we overcome that? Well, let me take the next few minutes to unpack it because I think maybe we've he heard this acronym before, F-E-A-R, fear, that spells this, that says false evidence appearing real. How many of you have ever heard that before? False evidence appearing real. And that can be true in many, many occasions, but today I wanna give you a different acronym for F-E-A-R that is gonna teach you how to overcome your fears. And the first one is this, letter F, to face your fears with faith. To face your fears with faith. Because there will always be some news story that is sensationalized in our culture. Whether it's global warming or terrorism or natural disasters or COVID or an economic meltdown, right? I mean, I certainly don't want to belittle any of those because those can be very real things. But choose that your faith is in God, not in the situation, not in the latest headline. That's not where our, our faith goes. Our faith looks at the one who holds it all in his hands. And in case you need to be reminded, nothing surprises God. There is nothing where an event happens where he goes, oh, I didn't see that coming. Oh my, what are we going to do? God sees it all and holds it all in his hand. Psalm 27.1 says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? Jesus says, listen, we, we've got to approach this with, with faith in our hearts to know that God is protecting us. It's a fortress around us that he's by our side. And we grow in trust. You see your next fill-in fear is defeated by trust. And trust in God is most secure. Fear is defeated by trust. And trust in God is most secure. When Paxson wasn't sure whether he wanted to go on that roller coaster, when I told him, I'm going to be with you. You're going to be safe. I would never let anything bad happen to you, right? I mean, we're in this together. It builds his trust. Okay, okay. I've trusted my dad before. I can trust him again. Same with our Heavenly Father. We've trusted him before. We can trust him again. And some of us, you know, you face real things. And let's say this week that something really fearful happened to you. Let's, let's say, you know, one of those things, it was just a paralyzing moment this next week, right, that took place. What if this happened? What if in the middle of your panic attack, an angel showed up from heaven and you knew as an angel from God and this is all the angel said to you, God knows and then disappeared. How would you feel about your situation? I mean, obviously after getting over the sheer shock of an angel showing up to visit you, I mean, what would, would that change anything for you? Of course it would. I mean, if an angel appeared to you and said, God knows, you wouldn't fear near as much. Your confidence would grow. But we don't need an angel to show up to tell us that. That God does know. That God has numbered the hairs on your head. He knows everything about your life. He knows. God says that even before you were even born, he knew all about you. Look at this, Psalm 56, 3 and 4. When I am afraid... I will trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What could this world do to me when I have God by my side? And so your next feeling, how do you trust God? You recognize that he created you and he loves you. He created you, he loves you, he knows all about you. He's by your side. Psalm 145, 8 and 9, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. I mean, when you begin to really live in that, it builds your trust and your confidence that when fear rises up, you go, nope, I don't have to believe the fear. I've got a God who's bigger than all of it. Right, it builds trust when you know that you're never out of his sight. Look at Psalm 139, 3. You are familiar with how many of our ways? What does that say? You're familiar with all of my ways. All my ways. That he has good plans for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plan to prosper you. Plan not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. 
right? It builds confidence to know that he forgives you and he's patient with you. Psalm 86, five, you are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in all, in love to all who call to you. So that's why as we deal with fear, we've got to start with faith. That there's a, a God in heaven who loves you, who watches over you. So face your fear with faith. Letter E, letter E, examine your assumptions in light of the facts. Examine your assumptions in light of the facts. The fact that you and I have fear in our lives is the result of living in this world, right? I mean, everywhere we look, it's doom and gloom. So naturally, we're gonna feel afraid. But here's what's interesting. Maybe you never knew this before. Scientists tell us, your next fill-in, that we're only born with two fears. We are only born with two fears. The fear of falling and the fear of loud, sudden noises. Everything else is learned. Isn't that fascinating? Scientists say you have a fear of falling, which would explain my fear of heights, right? And you have your fear of loud noises. But other than that, everything else is learned. Which means this, that every other fear that you have is determined by who you're listening to, what you're reading, or what you're watching. That is determining what fears are brought in. And we need to focus on the facts, not the what ifs. Right? We keep ourselves up and I think about all the what ifs and all the things that could go wrong. And I heard about something recently that has actually helped me. They said, when you are in a fearful moment, they said, the, here's something that you can do to help. To take a deep breath, count backwards from five. Five, four, three, two, one. And ask yourself this question. What if it all works out? What if it all works out? Because it's giving your brain and your mind another option that you aren't considering. And that's what fear does. Fear only wants you to consider the worst. All the what ifs of what could go wrong and yet we need to examine the facts that we recognize that 98% of the things that we're afraid of actually never really happen. But we let fear in the driver's seat of our life over and over and over again. And Jesus says, this is not how I want you to live. I do not want you to fear any longer. And so examine the assumptions with facts. And then letter A, attack your fear with action. And this is called courage, right? To face your fear sometimes head on. Just like Paxton did with that roller coaster, we're gonna face it head on. And courage isn't like evil Knievel, mad, crazy stunts, right? I mean, that's just a different risk tolerance than I have. That's not courage. That's just being crazy, right? I mean, but courage is, is refusing to follow the path of least resistance in order to do the right thing. Courage is holding on to your values even when you don't want to. Courage is saying no to good things so you can say yes to great things. Courage is having the tough conversations with someone when I'd rather put those things off. Right, that's what courage really is. And for some of you, your lack of courage has led you to procrastinate. Well, I'll just deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. And then it's never dealt with and it's fear and it's fear and it's fear and it's fear. Or your lack of courage has brought you to denial to just ignore it and say, nope, that's not even there. But in your heart of hearts, right, that fear is residing in you. That lack of courage is, is, is leading you to indecision. It's keeping you paralyzed to think, I don't even know what to do with my fear. And so we must take action to do something. Face it head on, remembering that God is with us. And then the last one, letter R, release your cares to God. F-E-A-R, release your cares to God. Tell God what you're afraid of. When was the last time you out loud told God what you were afraid of. That you just said it to him. God, here's what I'm going through. Here's what I'm afraid of. I mean, he knows. And he can be trusted. But see, we have to keep turning our eyes to him because where our focus is will determine the outcome. Is our focus on him or is it in our fear? Is it on him or in our fear? How are you doing at releasing your fear to God? I love this verse in Isaiah 41, 13. This says, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. 
Do not fear. I will help you. And some of us need that help today to let go of our fears. In closing, it reminds me of this story of my dad when he was in his mid-20s. He had gotten paid from work and was ready to deposit. And so he went to the bank. And if you remember, they used to have these tables where you'd fill out your deposit slip and all that. You know, I mean, this is before online banking, all this, right? You actually had to go to the bank if you wanted to deposit your check. And so he's there filling out his form when all of a sudden there's a loud commotion in the bank and he sees five men with long rifles, ski masks on, and they begin to announce to the bank, this is a robbery, everybody freeze. Put your hands up, everybody puts their hand up. You get down on the ground, you freeze, everybody hands up. And he's just frozen standing there, watching them walk around their, with their guns. And, and the one robber says to the next robber, get over there into every teller and take all the money. And so they were climbing from station to station and stealing all of the money. And my dad said while he was standing there, the idea of being a hero quickly evaporated in that moment. And out of his peripheral vision, he could see a large marble pillar that he slowly began to shuffle over until he was finally behind the pillar. And the pillar was between him and the robbers. And after some time, they got their money and the robbers ran out the door. And the police were called and, and eventually the people, everyone just kind of ran out of the bank. I mean, worst of it all, he didn't even get to make his deposit that day. I mean, how sad is that, right? He didn't even get to make his deposit. But I was thinking about this, that for far too long, fear has walked into your life and stood you up and said, freeze. For far too long, fear has stolen peace from you. For far too long, peace has stolen a good night's sleep from you. And that's what fear does. Fear is a robber in your life. And Jesus says, uh uh, this is not the life to the full that I've invited you into. No, no, no. I don't want you to fear any longer. I want you to put all of your trust and your hope in me. And as you do that, and you recognize I'm big enough to take care of it all, that fear will be displaced with trust. That fear will be taken out of your life and peace will be restored. And so maybe for you today, it's time that you look at your fear and you say, stop robbing me of my peace. You've stolen enough from me, now give it back. I'm gonna put all of my hope and my trust in Jesus because he's the one that's instructed me and said, do not fear anymore. Heavenly Father, we recognize that fear at times has such a way of paralyzing our lives. And it's not the best you have for us. So would you, by your Spirit, teach us to put our focus and all of our trust in you. That you'd give us wisdom with what we've heard today and the courage to apply it. So that as you command us not to fear, we can find the peace and the freedom that you've invited us into all along. Thank you, Jesus, for making it well with our soul. You're the one we need. You're the one we lean on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.